Okay, so hopefully people here know a little bit about what fully homomorphic encryption is all about. It, in a nutshell, allows for arbitrary computation on encrypted data. Um, in this talk, in this talk, Uh, hello, I need help. Oh, now it's working. In this talk, I'll be focusing on uh, linear transformations and more specifically on applying a fixed public linear transformation to an encrypted vector. Um, there are many other variations you could consider like uh, um, computations involving an encrypted matrix uh, and a plain text vector, an encrypted matrix and a an encrypted vector, but I'll be focusing on the situation where we have a public uh, uh, plain text matrix and, a, and, a, and an encrypted vector. And I'll be focusing on the case where we're looking at the BGV uh, fully homomorphic encryption scheme. A lot of the stuff I talk about today will actually apply to other schemes as well. Um, So I'll present some new algorithms uh, and talk about their implementation. The implementations are all in the HE lib uh, library, which Shai Halevi and I have been working on for a few years. Uh, we get speed ups of up to 75 times. So that's, uh, uh, you have to take this maybe with a, um, a bit of skepticism or a grain of salt, uh, truth in advertising. I mean, yes, we do get a 75 times speed up on some uh, parameter settings that do arise in practice. Uh, sometimes we get less, um, but that's about the best that we get out of what we do. Um, of course, you could also look at this more pessimistically and say, well, uh, our old implementation was 75 times slower than it really should have been, uh, and now uh, we're doing better. So um, why this problem? Well, one reason that we focused a lot on this problem is that it arises in bootstrapping um, for a lot of different... for. There's a few different ways of doing bootstrapping, but inevitably it involves some kind of a change of basis somewhere during the computation, and, and that's where this comes up. Um, there's a new way of doing bootstrapping that, we, uh, that came out this year at Eurocrypt, and we implemented this, and we found that most of the time is spent uh, performing this change of basis, and um, so improving the, the linear maps is, is very important here this problem really needs to get fixed. Uh, and we get a speed up of up to uh, about six times for the bootstrapping as a whole. Um, because not all the time is spent in bootstrapping on uh, linear transformations, but a lot of it is. And so with our improvements, we get a six times speed up. Okay, I'm gonna stop and ask for this problem to be fixed before I continue. I've wasted about five minutes on a two minute slide because of this. Am I pressing the button wrong? It's not advancing when I press it. I have to press it like 10 times. Okay, are you doing it something different? The left one. <laughs> left or right. Right to advance, left to the right. Okay, it seems to be working. Okay, so some review of the BGV crypto system. Uh, we're gonna be working a lot in a ring R, uh, with, um, which is the ring of integer polynomials modulo a cyclotomic polynomial phi n of x. The plain text space is going to be this ring of polynomials modulo cyclotomic modulo a small prime p. And the ciphertext space is going to be built from, we're going to be working a lot in this ring, um, uh, the ring of polynomials modulo an integer q, um, where q will be uh, a large number actually, and, uh, and the ciphertext will be a pair of these ring elements in RQ. Uh, a secret key will be a, also a pair of these ring elements, where the first one is actually uh, the unit, and the second one is um, kind of a random element in this uh, ring, uh, chosen with a specific kind of distribution, though. It's a small, a, a small norm ring element. And if you're given a ciphertext, which is a pair of these ring elements, and you want to decrypt, you basically just take the inner product of the ciphertext and the secret key, you do everything mod Q, reduce it mod Q, and then um, what you're left with is the message plus uh, some noise, and the noise is a small multiple of p. I'm 
pressing the button just like he did. OK. Um, so we're going to be, so a lot of the computation is in this ring RQ. And, and I want to talk about a couple of different ways of representing uh, elements in this ring because that will really have a bearing on, on the algorithms and their efficiency. The most natural one would just be the coefficient representation. You're working with the polynomials uh, and you just write down the coefficients. The other one we call double CRT. Uh, and here we're going to impose the restriction that the modulus Q is a product of small primes. So each of these small primes uh, has to contain an nth root of unity and is the, the we're working with uh, the cyclotomic polynomial phi n and we need nth roots of unity in each of these small uh, fields. And an element in RQ is going to be, I'm just going to put everything up here. An element in RQ is going to be, we, in double CRT, we're just going to take our polynomial, uh, reduce it, module each of these small primes, and then evaluate each of those polynomials uh, at these roots of unity. And that's kind of an equivalent representation. Um, so that's the double CRT representation. The nice thing about double CRT representation now is that, um, well, addition takes linear time. You just add things modulo each of these small primes. And so does multiplication by a constant. Also takes linear time, assuming that the constants are themselves represented in this double CRT format. Um, the one thing to note is that switching back and forth between double CRT and coefficient representation is, is somewhat expensive. You have to do Chinese remaindering, and you have to do these FF, FFTs fast Fourier transforms to go in between the coefficient and the, and the evaluation representation. So to multiply two ciphertexts uh, in double CRT representation, I won't go into the details, but basically you're just multiplying these double CRT, which double CRTs, which the, that itself is linear time. But then you end up with a ciphertext that's defined with, with respect to a different secret key. So you have to do some operation, which we call key switching. I'm pressing this button. There's one, there's two, okay. Um, so, what we have to do is encrypt this other key, right? We get an encryption with respect to the wrong key. We encrypt this other key under the original public key. Um, that has to go into the public information, which we call a key switching matrix. And using this, we can convert this product cipher text uh, back to uh, an equivalent encryption under the original key. So that's called key switching, which is kind of a, a key part of any um, uh, homomorphic encryption scheme. This key switching, though, is expensive. I'll talk a little bit more about it later, but it does require conversions between coefficient and double CRT representations, and those are actually somewhat expensive. Now, before I talk about uh, linear transformations, I need to talk a little bit about the, the structure of the plain text space itself. Remember that the plain text space is the ring of polynomials uh, mod p and mod phi n, basically. Uh, and if we look at how uh, the cyclotomic polynomial factors mod p, then we get a bunch of irreducible factors, and by the Chinese remainder theorem for polynomials, we get that this coefficient, that this uh, plain text space is, is isomorphic to uh, a product of finite fields. So we can think of um, the plain text space as being uh, a, a vector, representing a vector of finite field elements. So there'll be h of them, uh, h elements in the vector. Each entry is going to be uh, an entry in the finite field of cardinality p to the d, where d times h is equal to phi of n. So we can view the plain text space as yeah, a vector in this sense. And we can do addition and multiplication um, on plain texts and also homomorphically on ciphertexts kind of in, in parallel like this, kind of in a SIMD fashion. In addition to that, we can, we can move data around in between the slots. Um, each, if we look at integers j that are relatively prime to n, then each such integer j defines an automorphism on the plain text space that basically just takes the monomial x and maps it to x to the power j and leaves all the coefficients alone.
So homomorphic evaluation is easy, just you, especially in double CRT representation. You just, uh, just move, shuffle things around in the double CRT representation. But uh, it, again, just like for multiplication, it gives us uh, something that's encrypted with respect to the wrong secret key, and it requires another type of key switching. Um, but once we have that, then, this gives us a set of rotations that allow us to move data uh, between the slots. So we can do things in the SIMD fashion, uh, slot-wise, and then we can also move data around in between the slots. Just to give you more of a concrete idea, um, here's a sim simplified but actually not very typical setting. So if, if P, the thing defining the plain text space, is 1 mod N, then the cyclotomic polynomial splits completely over ZP. And what we really have is that then in this case, uh, the plain text space is isomorphic to a vector of elements where each element is in G of P. And then um, and we have an isomorphism that basically uh, maps a polynomial F of X to F evaluated at a primitive root of unity, omega to the power I, if omega is some primitive uh, nth root of unity uh, mod P. And then if we look at this automorphism that sends x to x to the j, if we're looking at this thing as a, as a vector of elements, what that's doing is it's taking uh, the, the component of this vector whose value is f evaluated at omega to the i and sending that to um, the f evaluated omega to the power i times j. So in effect, this is moving the data, I guess you have to reverse this, in slot ij, Moves, what, what used to be in slot i times j is now in slot i. If p does not equal 1 mod n, then something else similar happens to this, but the algebra is slightly more complicated, and I won't go into it here. The general case, the set of, the set of data movements or rotations is kind of determined by the structure of the group uh, Z and star modded out by the subgroup generated by P. And if you look at the, you know, the structure theorem for uh, um, finite abelian groups, then, yeah, you'll get some kind of decomposition of groups. Uh, so, for example, maybe this group structure is, you know, a, a product of two cyclic groups of order three, in which case we have nine slots, which we can view as a three-by-three three array, eventually. Um, and using the set of ro the, the automorphisms that we have, uh, we can either like rotate all the rows simultaneously by any amount, or we can rotate all the columns simultaneously by any amount. And more generally, we have is there, is there something else I can press? I'll happily do that. No, there's nothing up here except uh, some strange thing here. <laughs> Can I press another button? I, I mean, I, I know when you do it, it works, but when I do it, it doesn't. So maybe you should just press the button. You watch how I'm doing it. Am I doing something wrong? You see what I'm doing? It, it look OK. So I'll just keep clicking. There we go. So something happened there, and something happened in this slide. So, uh, so we have an encrypted vector with h slots. That's where we're at, right? So in the plain text space. And we have an encryption of this, and we want to apply a public matrix to this encrypted vector, right? So that's the, the whole point of this talk. And because I'm, I'm, I don't know how much of this I'm going to be able to cover, because I spend most of my time just pressing this clicker. So I'll start, there's an obvious approach, which is stupid, and you shouldn't do it, and I'm going to just skip over this slide as soon as I can. I can explain it while I'm doing this, except I'm very mad, and so I'm not in a very good mood right now. Okay, just quickly, right? So here you have a matrix times a vector. Somewhere in high school or, 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 or college, the first time you learned about matrix vector multiplication is maybe you learned that you can kind of sort of think of it as multiplying a column times V1 plus a column times V2 plus a column times V3, right? So you might say, well, maybe we can do something with that. But you have to remember, the, the, the vector is encrypted. 
right? So to apply this idea naively, you'd have to like come up with a way to take this encrypted vector and get three encryptions, one of all v1, one of all v2, and one of all v3. So in kind of the Intel, SIMD lingo, that would be like a broadcast type of thing, right? So you could do that. In fact, you could do it with uh, order h, if h is the number of slots, uh, rotations and multiplication by constants, but it's overkill and it's not the most efficient way to do it. A better idea, which thankfully Dan Bernstein straightened us out early on to get us not to do this, and suggested an old idea that was known to people who work in the uh, uh, parallel uh, computing industry, is to do something more directly with rotations. So what we can do is we can start with our vector that we have, and if you look what happens when we multiply the diagonal component-wise, we get uh, this vector. And then if we rotate, 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 if we, this uh, vector by one position, and we then look at what happens when we multiply by kind of a diagonal, let's say you have a diagonal that, that bends around and, and goes around and picks up some other elements. You get, you get this vector, and then you rotate one more time, and you pick up another diagonal, and you can check what you get is uh, exactly the matrix vector product that we want. So you can just do it with three rotations, or really your initial vector plus two. Now, this matrix, remember, is public, and everybody knows it, so th there's constants, and we can just kind of compute uh, ring elements that we form by computing a Chinese remaindering of of, of these three guys on this diagonal and then these three guys on the off diagonals. Um, and then we can even convert them to double CRT, form, double CRT format as a pre-computation. And, um, and then what we're left with is an algorithm that uh, takes about H rotations, which are expensive because they involve key switching and change of, uh, change of representation, and, the, and, and these multiplication by H multiplication by constants. Um, so here's a better idea. Uh, very old idea, baby step, giant step, it's always something to, to try, and in, indeed it helps a lot here. So let's define rho to the i as the operation of rotating a vector v, i positions. Uh, and here's what we want to compute based on the idea in the previous slide. We just want to sum over all indices i, some constant i that we pre-computed times the ith rotation of this vector. That's what we want to compute. And, and the ci's are just constants. So the observation is that rho is actually an automorphism on the plaintext space, and we can exploit that fact, right? So this is what we want to compute. So let's write each index i as j plus fk, where, uh, where f and g, uh, f and g are like uh, square root of h, and j is running uh, up to f, and k is running up to g. So I'm just kind of like decomposing i like this, and um, so this is just the, the same thing. And then what we're going to do on the next line is just pull out this, this rho to the fk. We pull that out. Of course, that messes up this constant. But, but it's an automorphism, so we have a handle on what everything is, right? So when we pull this out, we just have to replace this constant by rho to the inverse power fk times the original constant. And these are all constants, so they can be pre-computed, so we don't care. And that's it. So the algorithm becomes um, we first compute powers rho to the j uh, for j running up to this square root of h bound. Those are the baby steps. And then we compute all of these uh, sums of, of uh, multiply by constants and add everything up. And then we have the giant steps where we apply rho to the power fk um, for different values of k. Um, and the cost then is square root of h rotations for the baby steps. Uh, step two is just computing. We still have to compute h uh, multiplication by constants. We don't reduce that. And step three is uh, square root of h rotations itself. So that's what we gain with the baby step giant step method. I'm going to try to cover the other idea that I wanted to get at. So he, here's even a, a more better idea. Or, in other words, if two times h rotations are good, then maybe a single rotation is even better. So can we do this at the, co at the, equivalent, the, at the cost equivalent to a single rotation? So let's look at what, so to do that, I really need to dive into what happens when we do 
a homomorphic rotation. Uh, so we want to apply a rotation to an encrypted vector. And generally speaking, remember, we want, we want to apply a bunch of rotations. So, uh, so a ciphertext is, now remember what a ciphertext is, it's a pair of these ring elements. The first thing we do is we apply this raw automorphism, automorphism to the components of the ciphertext itself. And that's just shuffling around some data in these double CRT uh, representations. But now we have to do this thing called key switching, which now I have to kind of show you a little bit what it is. The first step in key switching is it's you really have to understand what all the issues are in terms of managing the noise and everything in a, in a homomorphic encryption scheme. But the first thing we need to do is, is, is take the component C1, or actually C1 prime after we've uh, applied the automorphism to it, and decompose it as a sum uh, in, in, into digits. So we're going to you can think of R sub K as you know, powers of some number, and we just want to decompose it into digits. So each coefficient of these polynomials gets written as a sum of digits, um, so that each digit is small enough so that we can uh, manage the noise appropriately. And this is expensive. This requires double CRT to coefficient conversion, because the only way we really know how to do this, uh, breaking into digit stuff, is we really need things in coefficient form. And then once we have that, then we take the public information, these key switching matrices that are part of the public key, really, and we need to um, take the digits that we computed and just uh, apply some linear maps to them, some, some simple uh, public linear maps. Um, everything here now, you can assume, is in double CRT representation, so it's fast and cheap. So the expensive part is just this part here. So the idea... is to just refactor these three steps. Basically, we're just going to swap the first two steps by using the fact, again, that row to the i is an automorphism that doesn't change the norm of anything by very much. So what we're going to do is we're going to initially do the key switching um, with part one, which is the break into digit part. We're going to do that to the original ciphertext instead of to the rotated ciphertext. And uh, so, so we get that. So we just break this into digits. That's expensive. Uh, but then, and then we're going to do the raw automorphism step applied to um, the individual digits that we got from uh, step one, step A here. So we're going to do the cheap raw automorphism step there. And then we're going to do the key switching step just as before. And this is equivalent because of the fact that this row to the I actually is an automorphism uh, on, on, uh, on the ring. and. Um, I, and, uh, and it doesn't change the norm very much, so all the things you need to make the key switching work still work here. Um, why is this better? Because we can perform this first expensive step just once for many rotations row to the i. The only thing that really used row to the i is this guy up here. Um, and so we just can do this once. So if we need to apply many powers of this row, we can just do this break into digits once. That's independent of row to the i. And then these other parts are cheap, so they should actually, um, uh, we can do those for each individual row to the i. So we, in the paper, we call this idea hoisting, just because uh, compiler writers call this uh, optimization of pulling out of a, a loop, a common uh, um, computation outside the loop, kind of hoist, you hoist the computation outside of a loop. So that's what we're doing here. Uh, so for a given encryption of a vector v, we can compute an encryption of many rotations of v, which is one expensive step, and h, if we need to get h rotations, h cheap steps. That's the takeaway. So if we apply this to matrix multiplication, on the one hand, this is going to be faster than the basic method that uses h rotations, because now Computing all these H rotations just requires one expensive step and H cheap steps. On the other hand, it actually may be slower than the baby step giant step thing, just because we're doing these H cheap things. They're cheap, but they're not free. And when and doing square root of H expensive things can be faster than doing H cheap things, depending on the relative cost of everything. And in practice, you have to look at really the constants in the running time that come in. And, for very large h, this can be slower than the, than the baby step giant step method. But on the other hand, we can combine both techniques and do the baby step giant step. In the first step where we compute the baby steps, we can definitely use the hoisting technique to, to, um, 
to compute, to hoist all of these rotations out. So, and we save a factor of two. So instead of two times H rotations, we get um, H rotations. So that's it. Thank you.